for having me. Um, I'm going to ramble a wee bit, if that's okay, and wander around and try to work out how to go from side to side. But that's a marker, maybe try that. Are you? Are you competent? Now, I usually do this in a urology conference, which is, are you continent? Which is like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you don't mind. Now, are you, can you do your job? Now, if you can do your job, can you prove it? And that was my starting point, um, because as a radiologist, I was uh, asked to teach the medical students, uh, I was in charge of the undergraduate radiology. And the way radiology works is, junior doctors need to look at x-rays. Consultants like me look at x-rays during the week, but at weekends we all play golf and nobody ever sees us, at least that's the rumour. So a junior doctor at the weekend may have to look at the x-ray on their own. Are they capable of doing that? Are they capable of deciding whether your aunt has broken her hip or whether there's a pneumonia or whatever? Are they? So the way radiology is structured in the university at the moment is we give them a week of x-rays and at the end of the week we ask the students what those x-rays were. Now some of you are maybe even as old as me, you'll remember the generation game? Remember the cuddly toy, percolator, all that sort of stuff? So if we tell, no matter how thick you are, we tell you these are a list of things and then we immediately ask you about that list, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get it right. And what happened was, when we tested the Queen's students, everyone passed the test. Now, any test that everyone passes is immediately a problem as far as I'm concerned. So we got volunteers and ethics approval to say, if we retest this group six months down the line, how good were they? And they were crap. <laughs> so we needed to find a better way to teach people to make them better, to find out how they retain information. So what we did was uh, built this system. It's not an app, it's an entire developmental system. Um, and we let it loose online. So that's the chest x-ray. People had to decide whether it was normal or abnormal. But the clever bit was, hidden behind it, if you thought it was abnormal, you had to type in what the abnormality was. So if you thought it was one abnormality, and you thought it was a different one, but you were both on the ball, and you typed in different descriptors, the system would recognize whether you're right or wrong. And not only that, the guy that uh, built this in the IT business set it out free as an iPad app, and within about five, six weeks, we had 60,000 users across the world. And we were tracking them. So we were giving them individual tests and they didn't realize it. You weren't getting the same test as someone else. We worked out what your strengths and weaknesses were and then prodded you with them. So what we did was, as soon as you got something right, we gave you an answer, told you what the abnormality was, but linked you to educational sites. And we followed whether you went to those sites or not. So within weeks, we were seeing a 30, 35% improvement in people. Looking amazing. Now, how did we get that into the system? Well, Quality 2020 in Northern Ireland invested in us. They gave us a year and a half long trial which is just completed. And what they said was, well, we want you to run it in radiology. We want you to do it in emergency medicine. And then they threw this obs and gynae thing in. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And Queen's set up a separate trial. So we've been running those for the last year. And that's a typical graph of the improvement curves. I'm going to talk about that because you think it's coming up and plateauing. So you get people to a certain level, and yeah, you can keep them there. But what we did was we serially made every test more and more and more difficult. So the fact that people are plateauing is against a background of more difficult tests, and we were able to prove that we were making the tests more difficult. Everybody gets a league table of their individual weaknesses. So every week they knew how their peers performed, how they performed, where their weakness was. So very much like Chris, feeding back and making it personal is what we were doing. We told them how good you were as a medical student versus a, a junior versus a consultant, so they got competitive. They wanted to get better than the, the level above them. Okay, we did two cycles over the last six months, over the last year. Baseline average result was 39% in one in the first cycle. Exit test result 62%, a 57% improvement. We then made the test slightly more difficult and give more information for the second set and another 57%. So within 10 weeks, you can take junior doctors and make them 57% better in a speciality. Consultants like me, well, you can see we're perfect, so there's no improvement to be made. <laughs> Consultant improvement, almost 20%. So it was working at every single level. Now this is a bit that really got it for me. We had trainee radiologists, people who are about to become consultants. We taught them x-rays, Th that's their bread and butter. We took an undifferentiated group of medical students who were frankly dire. 
and after 10 weeks, they got the same test. I didn't even make up the test, made up by a consultant in Craig Alvin. 75 Queen students took it, 20 radiologists are about to be consultants. Look at the average result in both. But the amazing thing for me was the time. The students were doing it far faster than the radiologists, but we record all sorts of things, very much like yours, because we're recording the most popular day of the week to take tests, the most popular time of the day. So you can create scenarios where the individual hours, and you could poke out specific tests to people at particular times of the day. But Queens are now looking at this. Just say, in one year in Queens, we have 280 students. So if you create a test for 280, and they all get 80% on it, brilliant, they're fantastic. But the 20% that they got wrong is completely different across that group. Me as a lecturer cannot create 280 new tests. The system automatically does that because it holds onto your strengths and weaknesses and works out where your profile is. So it will create 280 new tests and it will keep poking you at your weaknesses until you get better. So Queen's now are looking at the possibility of bringing in 30 students for a lecture on one subject and leaving the other 250 to side because they're okay at it. You focus on people's individual weaknesses, make it personal. The two questions were asked by the board, are the results statistically significant? The results for all of the trials went off to, to uh, independent analysis. They're all highly st statistically significant. Uh, can we independently verify that the tests were getting harder? So I thought I was making the tests more difficult, but how do I prove it? Well, I gave them to the Royal College of Radiologists, who are my governing body, blinded them to the order of the tests, two independent experts who examine examined the tests and concordantly said that the order we gave them was exactly the same. So we are making them more difficult. Now, the thing I want to tell you, because this is actually more exciting, the, if you read the newspapers, stillbirths, mothers dying in labour, really, really scary stuff. There's billions and billions in litigation every year across the UK for maternal or fetal deaths. And one of the big causes of that is that thing. That's called a CTG. So you know, ladies in labour, they put those elastic bands around their waist. I don't know whether you ever saw them. One of them checks the baby's heart rate. That's one squiggly line. The other squiggly line is the pressure that the uterus is uh, exerting. And the analysis of those two squiggly lines will tell you whether or not a baby's potentially in trouble and the birth should be expedited. Now, there are only three things to assess. Baseline, variability, and deceleration. You would think it's simple. And out of those three things, you have to come up with one or three conclusions. Whether the CTG is normal, whether it's abnormal, or whether somewhere in between non-reassuring. What could be easier? Three things to assess, three possible outcomes. The problem is, when you assess those three things, they expand out. So if it's normal or non-reassuring, we use different color codes to, to illustrate those. So normal is green, non-reassuring is yellow, abnormal is red. Whenever you move on to the second question, if, it's, if you have three normals in a row, that constitutes a normal CTG, but there are actually three and a half thousand possibilities. Now, if you think if you're a midwife or a doctor in the middle of the night delivering a baby, you can assess the baseline, you can assess the variability, and you can assess the decelerations. But can you hold on to three and a half different, three and a half thousand different combinations in your head? And the problem is that when people were coming down to their ultimate conclusion by working their way through this complicated algorithm, people were calling it non-reassuring for the wrong reason. They got the right answer, but the wrong reason to get there. So what we do is we record every individual subset, every decision that someone's made. So we know exactly how you got to your decision point. And by linking those through to educational sites, we've been able to discover patterns of why perhaps things haven't been good in that world. Now, this, this is a process and evolution where we're working now. There's new guidelines were issued in 2014 and what was called an updated sticker. So every mother in labor has a sticker filled in every hour during labor. We're now suggesting just use that on an iPad because we built all those guidelines into the system. So rather than a midwife or a doctor having to try and remember all those combinations, it's done for them and that can make a profound difference to mother and baby outcome. So, what we think we've built is a disruptive technology. I made the mistake of talking to IT crowds before and got that mixed up and talked about it's a destructive technology, <laughs> a different thing completely. <laughs> so, this technology changes how we teach. We can make it personal. We can find out where you're weak and focus on you. 
And when we've done that, we've shown a massive improvement. We've now hundreds of people who've gone through these trials, and not a single individual who's completed the test has shown anything other than, oh, I'll be finished long before that. <laughs> Can I talk to you about that? So this is Northern Ireland built, and the hope is that there'll be a worldwide application. And being Northern Ireland built, it's not me, it's not an IT team. We've had a host of people from right across Northern Ireland in terms of the medical uh, and midwifery specialities who've been building this product with us. And there's hope that the implementation board who are overseeing the project will uh, work with us to, to expand it further. Last week, we won the Innovation in Quality and Efficiency Award 2016. No, please, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> you are. I didn't get there to pick up the prize. That's not me in the red dress. <laughs> this should have been me. I should have been there doing you know, the whole thing. But where was I? I was with Brenton Mulgrew at the back of the room looking like that. Oh. Oh. No, you know the snow plough? Skiing? Yeah. Don't try the nose plough. <laughs> Much more painful. So what we've built is an intelligent, adaptive e-learning platform, and our hope is that we'll be able to, to expand this right across the globe. But you think about your speciality, the questions at the beginning, are you competent? Think about people in the financial services industry, people in outside medicine, all sorts of industries. We can identify whether you can do your job, we can find out where you're weak, and we can poke you until you get better. Thank you very much. Okay.